Uh, who is, among uh, other things, president of the M.K. Gandhi um, Institute for Nonviolence. I, I don't know why this was the case, but uh, when I was a child growing up, I'm, um, I'm into uh, my early 60s, and some of you probably uh, thought I was uh, much older than that even, perhaps. But I remember uh, my father used to be telling me about Mahatma Gandhi and uh, obviously a, a hero of his. And so it's a name that I have uh, heard for, uh, for, for virtually all my life. And uh, so it is just a wonderful pleasure to be able to meet uh, his grandson. I have uh, the video of Gandhi's life that I have watched on several occasions. And so uh, this is uh, when I was asked a number of, uh, of, of weeks ago to, uh, to say a few words of welcome on behalf of the university and introduce the guest speaker. Um, I wasn't aware who the guest speaker was yet. I, wasn't, I hadn't been told that, and so it's a delight to introduce uh, Dr. Aaron Gandhi to you. Uh, Dr. Gandhi, as uh, some of you may know, uh, was actually raised in, in South Africa and, of course, encountered, as you know, the life of Gandhi himself, his grandfather, he was involved in South Africa as part of his career. Uh, but uh, Dr. Gandhi uh, was raised uh, in, in South Africa, uh, but as a quite a young child, he was um, uh, taken by his parents to actually meet his grandfather and uh, sit under his tutelage. Uh, I think they wanted to have that very positive influence uh, in this uh, young man. And there's no question, as I have read a bit of his biography, uh, that Dr. Aaron Gandhi was profoundly influenced uh, by, his, uh, by his grandfather. At uh, uh, the age of 20, uh, he moved to uh, re returned to India, uh, where his father, of course, had been, and uh, worked as a journalist and a reporter for the Times of, of India. Um, he has written uh, literally hundreds of articles and also a total of uh, eight books. So he's an accomplished author and journalist. Uh, he published the Suburban Echo uh, weekly in Bombay from, 1880, from 19, 1985 to 1987. He has really envisioned and edited uh, a, a work called uh, World Without Violence, Can Gandhi's Dream Become a Reality? So Dr. Gandhi is making a major contribution to keep the vision and the ideals of uh, Mahatma Gandhi alive as uh, those, those dilemmas that Mahatma Gandhi, of course, addressed in a nonviolent way, of course, uh, continue to uh, be with us. But this work is a collection of essays and poetry from noted international scientists, artists, and political and social leaders. Uh, the uh, Gandhis came to, uh, moved to, uh, in 1987 to uh, the United States. Um, Dr. Gandhi, interestingly enough, met his uh, wife, uh, Sunanda. Uh, she's a nurse. And uh, while he was having surgery, they met, and, uh, and that was a long-standing uh, relationship that went beyond her uh, care for him at that time, of course. And they uh, came, they, they were um, found analogous issues in the United States to what they'd encountered in um, India and in South Africa in terms of uh, discrimination on the basis of color and caste and so forth. And so in 1991, uh, they both together founded the M.K. Gandhi Institute for Nonviolence. Its mission is to examine, promote, and apply the principles of nonviolence uh, through uh, action and through research and workshops and seminars and community service. This institute is located at Christian Brothers University in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, where Dr. Gandhi is a scholar in, in residence. But he, uh, he spends some time there, but he also spends a lot of time traveling uh, throughout the world, in fact, uh, lecturing and talking about the issues 
um, some of which we will hear um, this evening. But this uh, institute is very active in community and educational affairs. I think without any further ado, I do want to uh, uh, not take any further time from Dr. Gandhi. He's going to be speaking to us uh, this evening on nonviolence or non-existence, options for the 20th, 21st century. I'm sure you will join me in warmly welcoming him to the podium this evening. Thank you very much. You know, thank you, Dr. Paul, uh, Paul LeWong, for inviting me here to this conference and giving me the honor to deliver the keynote speech. I would like to invite all of you to participate in a little experiment with me. I'd like to ask you to pair up with the person sitting next to you and one member of the partnership to make a tight fist and imagine that you have the world's most f famous diamond in the fist. And I'd like the other member to open the fist. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now tell me very frankly, how many of you asked the person to open the fist? <laughs> so you, you see, you see how violent we are. Now there's a lot of work to be done to change our attitudes. Uh, grandfather realized this in 1945 when uh, a journalist asked him what the future of humanity was going to be after the bomb was exploded over uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that's when grandfather said that uh, humanity has now only two options, nonviolence or non-existence. And although he said this in terms of um, the nuclear threat that hung over us and still continues to hang over us, he also meant it in terms of the threat from within, the destruction of our own humanity, the violence that we see being experienced every day, the things that we do to one another, and all the inhuman attitudes that we have developed towards each other, all of this is gradually destroying us from within. And we need to get up and take note of that. Grandfather learned his philosophy of nonviolence from three women. When he was growing up, the first woman who influenced him was his mother, who was a very spiritual lady, and uh, she observed vows and, uh, and um, prayed every day and, and was a very spiritual person. And he got the sense of spirituality from her and also the sense of discipline. Because she used to take vows all the time, vows like not eating before she could see the sun. Now, one may say that what's so great about that? We see the sun every day so we can eat. But she used to take that vow during the monsoon periods in, in India. And sometimes during the monsoon periods, you didn't see the sun for days together. So she wouldn't eat for all that time. But she would continue to do all her household chores. She would continue to cook and feed the family and take care of the family and everything with a smile on her face every day. And that discipline 
he learned from his mother. He says in his autobiography that he often used to sit at the window and pray to God, please let the clouds part a little so that the sun would peep out and my mother can see it and eat. And sometimes when it did, he would shout at his mother, come quickly to the window. But before she could leave everything and come to the window, the clouds would gather up again and she couldn't see the sun. And she would just smile and go away and say, well, God doesn't want me to eat today. So that spirituality was ingrained in him at a very early age there. The second person who influenced him was his uh, nanny. He was a very frisky young boy at that age, and he kept running away all the time, and it was very difficult for his parents to keep track of him, and so they employed a nanny to take care of him there. The nanny was quite old and uh, old enough to be his mother, but at that age, grandfather was a very fearful person. He was afraid of all kinds of things. He was afraid of snakes. He was afraid of uh, thieves, robbers. Uh, he, he just had a very fertile imagination, and he was afraid of all these things. He couldn't enter a dark room. He couldn't sleep in a room without a light on. And... Um, so his nanny taught him that when you are afraid, all you need to do is chant the name of the Lord, and in this case, the Lord Rama, and uh, he will protect you. And so he began to do that, and he felt the power of protection from God. And that was another spiritual message that he got from his nanny. But the most important lesson that grandfather says he learned was from grandmother. Now perhaps you are not all aware of this, but they were married at the age of 13. In those days, getting married at that age was a common thing. And they were married at that age, and grandfather says that he didn't know what the role of a husband should be. And so he started going to the library and getting books on the subject. And obviously those books were written by male chauvinists <laughs> because all of them spoke about how the husband should lay down the rules and enforce the rules and make sure that the wife obeyed them. And so the first day he came home and he told his wife, my grandmother, that from tomorrow you're not going to leave the house without my permission. And that's an order, and he says, no arguments about it. And grandmother heard him quietly and didn't respond, didn't say anything. She just quietly went to bed, got up the next day and continued to do what she always did. She continued to go out and visit and go to the temple and do everything and never bothered to get grandfather's permission. And a few days later when he realized that she was not obeying him, he confronted her again and he said, how dare you disobey me? Haven't I told you that you cannot stir out of the house without my permission? And at that point, grandmother quietly without losing her temper, she told him, she said, I was brought up to believe that we must always obey the elders in the house. And I believe the elders in this house are your parents. Now, if you're trying to tell me that I should not obey your mother, but obey you instead, let me know so that I can go and tell your mother I'm not going to obey her. <laughs> And grandfather said that that was the most important lesson in nonviolence that he had ever learned there. Now just imagine if somebody were to tell you that, what would our reaction be? 
we would immediately flare up in anger and, and say all kinds of things and do all kinds of things and sometimes it could have led to the breaking up of a relationship. So anger is a very important aspect and anger is something that we need to learn about. We never learn about it, we never teach anything about anger, what is anger and how do we use it. So we allow everybody to find their own ways of dealing with <coughs> anger and we all end up abusing anger. I had this experience too when I was growing up in South Africa as you were told in the introduction. At the age of 10, I was beaten up by some white youths because they thought I was too black. And then a few months later, I was beaten up by some black youths because they thought I was too white. <laughs> and it filled me with a lot of rage. I wanted an eye for an eye. I wanted to be able to be big and strong so that I could beat up all these people who messed around with me. And it became such an obsession with me that I started subscribing to Charles Atlas's exercise programs so that I could build muscles and be strong to deal with them. And that's when my parents decided to take me to India and give me the opportunity to live with grandfather and hopefully learn something from him. And I think that was a wonderful decision because I'm ever grateful to my parents for having taken that decision. I think in many ways those 18 months that I spent with grandfather changed the course of my life completely. The f very first thing that grandfather taught me was understanding anger. He said, there's nothing wrong with anger. There's nothing to be ashamed of anger. So it's a wonderful thing. What we need to be ashamed of is how we use it or how we abuse it. But if we learn to channel that energy positively, we can use it for the good of humanity. He said anger is like electricity. It's just as powerful and just as useful as electricity is. But only if we use it intelligently. But we all know what would happen if we abuse electricity. It could destroy us and destroy everything around us. So just as we channel electricity and bring it into our lives and use it for the good of humanity, we've got to learn to channel anger in the same way so that we can use that energy for the good of humanity rather than abuse that energy and cause violence and destruction which doesn't help anybody at all. We don't solve any problems by beating up or, or violence or anything. We only aggravate the problems. What we try to do through violence is try to control people out of fear. We do this at home with our children. We threaten them that if they don't behave, they are going to be punished. We are controlling them for, through fear because we have the authority to punish them. We tell them they, they, they've got to behave or, or face punishment. We do the same thing nationally in societies. We punish criminals. We lock them up and, and uh, punish them but we don't try to reform them. We don't try to find out why are these people doing what they are doing and how best can we change them so that they can become good human beings again. We are quick to resort to violence. At every stage, we resort to violence to, to uh, try to resolve a, a problem. But we never resolve that problem. We only are able to contain that problem only till the time that we are able to keep that fear, the pressure of fear on the person or on the nation. The moment that fear is gone, that person or the nation erupts 
and, and rebounds, and we are faced with another calamity. And that's why we had this arms race for all these years, and we are again going back to the same uh, tradition in, in the United States that we have to keep escalating the arms and keep escalating our, our ability to inflict fear on other people, to be able to control people. But for how long can we control people by fear? We cannot do this forever. There comes a time when somebody is going to get the better of us. And we saw that now in September 11th. Whoever had imagined that an ordinary commercial aircraft could become a, 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 a weapon to destroy people. But they've used the commercial aircraft to destroy people. And we are aghast. Why are they doing this kind of thing? How can they how can they hurt innocent people? But what we don't see is that over the years, the nature of violence has continuously changed. We have been party to that change too. From the conventional warfare in World War I, we changed the whole rules and regulations in World War II, and we are constantly changing that and, and escalating the level of violence. So why are we surprised when somebody else also changes that? We have got to understand and accept that those people who did what they did, I'm not saying that they did right, or I'm not uh, making any um, excuses for what they have done. What they did was awful. All violence is awful. But let's accept the fact that these people have come to such desperation that they don't know what else to do, how else to, to fight this war that they are, they are struggling with and, and what best way they can uh, get attention of the people there. I don't think the young Palestinian kids who are going and becoming uh, sacrificial lambs uh, in Israel are doing it out of love or, or like the media tells us that they are doing it because they are going to have a better life in heaven. They are doing it because they are desperate. And they don't know how else to, to deal with this whole situation. So let's look at this pragmatically and try to find a solution to this whole problem and try to control our anger, which is the fundamental basis on which we can develop a philosophy of nonviolence, to control our anger and become more peaceful and become capable of using that energy more uh, efficiently. I was about 13 when I learned that lesson. I was a feisty 13 year old. And after learning that lesson, I wanted to see whether the grandfather himself had learned the lesson or not. And so I decided to test him and this was the time in his life when he was involved in many important things. The freedom of India was about to be uh, given and, uh, and every, lots of things were happening. The country was being partitioned and, and good things were happening and bad things were happening and grandfather was in the midst of all of this. But while he was fighting the British for independence of India, he was also concerned about the emancipation of Indian women, the emancipation of the so-called untouchable people, the education of young children. All of these programs he was concerned about, and so he had people working in these fields, 
and trying to transform all of these people there. And as we all know that these projects need funding. And grandfather decided the easiest way for him to raise the money he needed for these programs was by selling his autograph. And so he put a fee of $5 for each autograph. And every morning and evening when he held his prayer services and hundreds of people would assemble there for his uh, prayer services, they would also come and seek his autograph. And it was my duty while I was living with him to go out into the audience and collect the autograph books and the money and bring it to him for his signature. And one day I thought to myself, I said, if everybody could get his autograph, why not me? After all, I'm his grandson and I deserve an autograph too. And so I got myself a little autograph book and I slipped it into the pile that I took to him and hoped that he would not notice the absence of money there. But when he came to that book, he said, why is there no money for this autograph? And I said, because it's my book. And he said, well, you should know that I don't make an exception even for grandsons. That if you want an autograph, you will not only have to pay me for this, but you have to earn the money and pay me. Don't ask your parents for it. And I said, no way. I said, you are my grandfather and I'm going to make you give me this autograph free. <laughs> So he laughed and said, all right, let's see who wins. And from that day, every day, when he was in high-level political discussions with Indian politicians and British politicians, I would barge into the room with my autograph book and thrust it in his face and demand an autograph. My logic was that just to get rid of me, he would sign the book and give it to me. But instead, every time I became too boisterous, all he did was put his hands across my mouth, press my head against his chest, and went on talking politics. <laughs> on many occasions, the other politicians used to get exasperated with grandfather and tell him, why don't you give him the autograph and be done with it? He comes and disturbs our meetings every day. And grandfather would only smile and say, don't worry, this is a private joke between the two of us. You don't have to get involved in it. But the long and short of it was that he never gave me the autograph. And I don't remember his ever telling me to get out of the room and leave him alone. As we would do with our children, when they came into the room and disturbed us while we are working on something important. We shoo them out, get out, leave me alone. Can't you see I'm working on something important just now? We'll talk about it later. He never, ever did that to me. And that's when I realized that if he was able to control his anger to that extent, if we can achieve 50% of that, we would be able to reduce the level of violence in our lives very substantially. So it's a question of making an effort to learn how to channel that energy of anger into positive action rather than destructive action. I also learned from him the profoundness of his philosophy of nonviolence. Today a lot of us seem to feel that when we talk about nonviolence, it's anti war or non violence, that we don't use any violence. That's not it. There's much more to it than, than the name denotes. It's all about life, the meaning of life, and the state of life in which we are living today. Now, he taught me this lesson through a little pencil. 
A little three-inch butt of a pencil became a major subject for me one evening. When I was walking home from school and I looked at this pencil and it was about three inches long and I thought to myself, I deserve a better pencil. This is too small for me to use. So without a second thought, I just threw that pencil away because I was so sure grandfather would give me a new pencil when I asked him for one. But that evening when I asked him for a new pencil, instead of giving me one, he subjected me to a lot of questions. He wanted to know how the pencil became small and where did I throw it away and why did I throw it away and on and on and on. And I couldn't understand why he was making such a fuss over a little pencil until he told me to go out and look for it. And I said, you must be kidding. I said, you don't expect me to look for a little pencil in the dark? He said, oh, yes, I do. He has a flashlight. <laughs> he gave me a flashlight and sent me out to look for this pencil, and I must have spent about two hours searching for it. And when I finally found it and brought it to him, he said, now I want you to sit here and learn two very important lessons. The first lesson is that even in the making of a simple thing like a pencil, we use a lot of the world's natural resources. And when we throw them away, we are wasting the world's natural resources, and that is violence against nature. The second lesson is that because in an affluent society we can afford to buy all these things in bulk, we overconsume the resources of the world, and because we overconsume them, we are depriving people elsewhere of these resources, and they have to live in poverty, and that is violence against humanity. <laughs> and that was the first time I realized that all these little things that we do every day, consciously and unconsciously, are all acts of violence. Just imagine how many things we waste every day. Because we have so much of it, we don't know what to do with it. We just let it go, throw it away. And every time we throw away something good, something that somebody can use, we are being a party to violence that is consuming all of us. So we have to be the change we wish to see in the world. It has to begin with us. We can't work for peace, we can't work for nonviolence as long as we don't practice it ourselves. It has to start with ourselves and it has to grow from us to, to others and eventually to the whole world. He also made me draw <clears throat> a family tree of violence on the same principles as a genealogical tree with violence as the grandparent and physical violence and passive violence as the two offsprings. And every day before I went to bed, I had to analyze my day's experiences. Everything that I may have seen or read or experienced or done to other people, everything had to be analyzed and put in their appropriate places on that tree. In less than a year, I was able to fill up the whole wall in my room with acts of passive violence. Now, physical violence is something that we understand. It's all the the physical manifestations of violence where we use physical force against one another. All the wars and killings and beatings and murders and rapes and, and all of these things where we use physical force is physical violence. But passive violence is something where we don't use any physical force. But nevertheless, we hurt people it's all the hate and the prejudice and the name-calling and teasing and, and the wasting of resources and, 
and you name it, and anger, and you know, all of these things that we do to one another, consciously and unconsciously, that hurt people somewhere, all of that is passive violence. And the connection between passive violence and physical violence is that we commit passive violence all the time, every day of our lives, and that generates anger in the victim, and the victim then explodes into physical violence. So it is passive violence that fuels the fire of physical violence. So logically, if we want to put out the fire of physical violence, we have to cut off the fuel supply. And the fuel supply comes from each one of us. So unless we look at ourselves and do some introspection and bring about that change in ourselves, we can't really change the world. I demonstrated to you this, this evening that even in little things, that instead of asking the person, we immediately become physical. It's become so much a part of us there. And we need to understand that, and we need to look at that, and we need to change that if we want to change the world and become less violent there. But the most important aspect of his philosophy of nonviolence is about building relationships. And that's where the state of the world and state of relationships and the the state of life itself comes into question. Today we have no relationships worth the name. Whether it's at individual level or national level or societal level, at any level we don't have any relationships. Because our relationships are all based on selfishness and self-interest. What am I going to gain from it? And if I don't gain anything from it, why should I bother to have a relationship? And when we have relationships that are based on such negative principles, you're creating a conflict, and that conflict is immediately going to end up in violence. There. Grandfather said that relationships must be built on the four principles of respect, understanding, acceptance, and appreciation. We've got to respect ourselves and respect each other and respect our connection with all of creation. Now, we are not independent individuals. We are inter interdependent, interrelated, and interconnected people. That what happens to one happens to others also, eventually. And we've got to respect that fact and live accordingly. And it's only when we respect that fact that we will understand who we are and what we are and why are we here on earth. We are not here by accident. We are here to fulfill a purpose. But we would be able to fulfill that purpose only when we know what our role in creation is. Today, although we are the most intelligent of the species in creation, we are also in one sense the most ignorant of species. Because we are the only ones who don't know what our role in creation is. So we've got to come to an understanding of our role in creation. And when we come to that understanding, then we will be able to accept people as human beings and not identify them by the labels that we have put upon them. Today we have so many labels on ourselves that we have stopped looking at the per person behind those labels. We identify them only by those labels, social labels, economic labels, religious labels, gender labels, color labels, you name it and we have a label. 
And we look at people by those labels. We've got to take those labels out. And we've got to learn to look at each other as human beings. Not as black, white, brown, or not by their nationalities or, or their economic standing, but human beings. And it's only when we can accept that, that we will be able to appreciate our own humanity. So that is the, the principle of his philosophy of nonviolence. He started this philosophy unconsciously. When he went as a young man to South, South Africa as a lawyer to set up a practice and earn money there, he didn't expect to, to uh, develop the philosophy of nonviolence or to use it there. He just went with one intention. He wanted to set up a legal practice and earn money because he had a heavy debt to pay back. The family had borrowed so much money for his education in England, and all of that had to be paid back again there. So that was his only objective in going to South Africa. But within a week of his arrival there, he became a victim of hate and prejudice. And that opened his eyes. And it was way back in 1893 that he began to realize what is happening to humanity. Why are we becoming so hateful and prejudicial and violent? That the state of life on earth was in peril. And he decided the only way we can stop this from happening is by resorting to nonviolent action. And he developed the philosophy of nonviolence at that point. But then he practiced this nonviolence in South Africa to gain political rights for his people. But as he went along with this practice, he realized the potential of this philosophy. That it was not just a conflict resolution thing, but it was a way of life. That it was the very meaning of life. That unless we make it a part of ourselves and improve ourselves and by improving ourselves, improve the society and the people around us, then only we can save humanity. And he did this. And that's why he changed the philosophy and he stopped calling it the philosophy of nonviolence and started calling it Satyagraha because he couldn't find an English term for it. Now, Satyagraha is two words. Satya meaning truth and agra meaning pursuit of. And he said, our life is a pursuit of truth. That every one of us is pursuing the truth. Nobody possesses the truth. Now that's a major thing there. Because a lot of us seem to think that we already possess the truth. We don't need to pursue it. And that in itself creates a major conflict there. Especially today when we see people fighting over religion and killing each other in the name of God. They're doing it because they think they, they possess the truth. But we don't possess the truth, we are all pursuing the truth. And when we have that understanding that we are all honestly and diligently pursuing the truth, then we would be able to accept all the different religions as one, which he was able to do. His prayer services every morning and evening included hymns from all the major religions of the world. All of us sat together and sang hymns from all these religions there. 
And everybody who came and joined the prayers there, nobody asked whether you were a Hindu or a Muslim or a Sikh or, or a Christian or what. You just came and sat and participated because these were universal prayers. And he said in his writings that a friendly study of all the scriptures is the sacred duty of every individual. Now that's very important. He emphasized the word friendly because many critical studies have been made, but not many people have made a friendly study of all the religions. And he did this in his life. And he was able to see that all the religions of the world had some modicum of truth in there. Nobody had the whole truth. And that we can learn from each one of them, just take the nuggets of truth from each one and incorporate that in your own life. And that way we are able to enhance our own beliefs and our own religions rather than diminish them. He said, religion is like climbing a mountain. And we are all going up to the same peak, so why should it matter to anybody which side of the mountain we choose to climb up from? It's an individual choice. It's a personal choice. And we should accept that and appreciate that and encourage people to go from different directions and look at the truth from different directions or desserts or something all the time and if he didn't get any of that he would just take spoons full of sugar and eat them and the result was that he started getting a rash all over his body and his parents took him to the doctor and the doctor said you got to stop giving him sweets and when he's cured, then you can monitor how much he eats and, and uh, control it. So the parents came home, and <clears throat> every day they would nag him and say, the doctor said no sweets for you, so you're not going to get anything. And yet they would have sweets on the table, and everybody else would be partaking of it. Uh, and so this boy didn't obey his parents. When nobody was looking, he would grab some and eat it. So a few days later, when his mother realized that he is not obeying her, he brought the boy to grandfather and pleaded with grandfather to talk to him and explain to him why he should not be eating sweets. And grandfather said, you come back after 15 days and I'll speak to him. And this mother didn't know why she had to wait for 15 days. Why couldn't grandfather speak to him now? But she went away and came back after 15 days. And then grandfather took this boy aside and spoke to him for less than a minute. And the boy went home and gave up sweets. He wouldn't touch sweets anymore. And so the parents came back to grandfather and asked him, what kind of a miracle did you perform? He said, we were trying to tell him the same thing and he wouldn't listen to us and yet you were able to speak to him for less than a minute and he instantly obeys you. And grandfather said, it wasn't a miracle. He said, the reason I asked you to come back after 15 days was I had to give up eating sweets before I could ask him to give up. Which the parents were not doing. They were using their parental authority like we do when we are faced in similar situations. We use our parental authority to make our children do what they are supposed to do, but we are not willing to make the sacrifice along with them. And that is an act of violence. <clears throat> the second story is something that happened to me. When we were back again in South Africa after 
<clears throat> our a wonderful visit with grandfather. And I was 16 years old, and we were living in the community that grandfather had started in South Africa, which was 18 miles outside the city of Durban. And it was in the midst of sugarcane plantations. Our nearest neighbors were miles away from us. And so when my two sisters and I were growing up there, we didn't have anybody our age to relate to. <laughs> So we would look forward to going into town and visiting friends or seeing a movie or something. And one Saturday I got that opportunity <clears throat> when my father had to go to town to attend a conference and he didn't feel like driving that day. And he asked me if I would drive him into town and I jumped at the opportunity and said yes. And since I was going into town, my mother gave me a list of groceries that she needed. And on the way into town, my father reminded me of all the little chores that had been pending for a long time, like getting the car serviced and oil changed and all that. And he said, since you have the whole day to yourself, will you please attend to all this? And I said, okay. And when I dropped him off at the conference venue, he said, at five o'clock in the evening, I will wait for you outside this auditorium. Come and pick me up here and we'll go home together. And I said, okay. And I rushed off and I did all my chores and I bought all the groceries and left the car in the garage with instructions to do whatever was necessary and made a beeline to the nearest movie theater. And being a 16-year-old, I was so engrossed in a John Wayne double feature <laughs> that I didn't realize the passage of time. The movie ended at 5.30, and I ran from there to the garage and got the car and rushed to where my father was waiting for me. It was almost six when I reached there one hour late and he was naturally anxious and wondering what happened to me and he was pacing up and down and so the first question he asked me is why are you late and instead of telling him the truth i was so ashamed to tell him that i was sitting there watching a john wayne double feature that i lied to him and i said the car wasn't ready i had to wait for the car not realizing that he had already called the garage and asked them. <laughs> when he caught me in the lie, he said, there's something wrong in the way I brought you up that didn't give you the confidence to tell me the truth, that you felt you had to lie to me. And I've got to find out where I went wrong with you. And in order to do that, he said, I'm going to walk home. 18 miles, I'm not coming with you in the car. There was absolutely nothing I could do to make him change his mind. He just started walking. It was after 6 o'clock in the evening. It was already getting dark. Much of those 18 miles were through sugarcane plantations, dirt roads, late in the night. I couldn't leave him and go away. So for five and a half hours, I was crawling behind him, watching him go through that pain and agony for a stupid lie that I uttered. And I decided there and then that I was never going to lie again. And I think that was a very powerful lesson in nonviolent parenting. I think if he had punished me the way we punish our children when we catch them doing something wrong, I don't think I would have learned the lesson I think I would have just suffered the punishment and gone on doing the same thing over and over again. But by this, taking the responsibility on himself and teaching me a powerful lesson, he made me learn something so profound that it's 50 years since that incident and it's still fresh in my mind as though it happened yesterday. So that is the power of nonviolence. That is what we need to understand and learn so that we can all together transform this world. 
I want to end with one more short story. <clears throat> it's the story of an ancient Indian king who once became very curious about the meaning of peace. And he invited all the intellectuals in his kingdom to come and explain the meaning of peace. And everybody came and did their very best, but nobody could convince him. And finally, there was an intellectual from another town who came on a visit, and he stopped by to pay his homage to the king. And the king asked him this question, and this intellectual said, the only person who can give you an answer to this is an old sage who lives just outside your kingdom. But he is so old that he cannot come to you. You will have to go and ask him this question. So the next day the king went to the sage <clears throat> and asked him this question. The sage quietly went to the back of the house, came back a few minutes later with a grain of wheat and placed that grain of wheat in the palm of this king and he said, here is your answer. And the king was too proud to say that he didn't know what a grain of wheat had to do with peace. So he clutched that grain of wheat and went back to the palace and he found a little gold box and placed it in the box. And every morning he would open that box and look for an answer and he couldn't find any answers. Then a few days later, this intellectual who introduced him to the sage came on a return visit. And the king asked him again, and he said, you sent me to him and he gave me this grain of wheat and I don't know what this grain of wheat has to do with peace. Now explain it to me. So this intellectual says it's a very simple thing. He said, as long as you keep this grain of wheat in this box, nothing is going to happen. It's going to perish and that will be the end of the story. But if you allow this grain of wheat to interact with all the elements, it will sprout and grow and very soon you will have a whole field of wheat. And that is the meaning of peace. That if you have found peace for yourself, keeping it locked up in your heart for your own personal benefit is not going to help anybody at all. It will perish with you. But if you allow that peace to interact with all the elements, then it will grow and sprout and very soon we'll have a whole world of peace. So I have come here today to give you that grain of wheat and I hope that you will not let it rot but allow it to grow and flourish. Thank you. probably all feel that we've been sitting at the feet of a very wise counselor this evening, haven't we? The program has been arranged so that we uh, will be giving opportunity for uh, three discussants, they're called, or I'd prefer to call them respondents, to uh, these very thought-provoking uh, words of uh, Dr. Gandhi. And I think we will just go in the alphabetical order that these uh, uh, respondents are listed as in the program. Uh, first of all, uh, Dr. John Gelvin uh, comes from Seattle, Washington, uh, is in private practice uh, there um, in Seattle. Um, secondly, uh, Dr. Drew Letter will be coming to speak to us. He, hails from uh, Loyola College, where he's a professor of philosophy. Uh, you'll notice that he has both uh, an MD and, and, a, and a doctorate. 
and is teaching there, as I understand, in, in, at Loyola. And uh, last but not least, uh, Dr. Harry Sharma, who uh, for some time taught uh, in the sociology department at uh, Simon Fraser University, and uh, more recently has been given the status of Professor Emeritus, and he will respond as the third individual. I think these uh, respondents have been asked to uh, confine their remarks to, uh, to 10 minutes. Uh, they need not take all that time, and in fact, the uh, one has said uh, he may not do that. Uh, I may invoke the prerogative of the chair um, to uh, remind the person if they do go over 10 minutes, I think we would like to um, hear uh, responses. I think, first of all, uh, from, from our guest speaker, uh, after these discussants, uh, our respondents uh, give their thoughts. But uh, I would, if we have time, like to give you as members of the audience a chance to uh, ask questions of our distinguished guest speaker this evening. So uh, that will be uh, the order of uh, our procedure now, um, not going past uh, 9 o'clock, the declared time. And uh, we will stop before that if, uh, if there are no further questions. First of all, then, uh, Dr. John Galvin. Uh, in the spirit of the example that was just given, it, it, if I talk more than 10 minutes, you can talk for 10 hours <laughs> and teach me a lesson. <laughs> The truth shall set you free. The truth shall set you free. I forget who said this, but whoever it was, I think should have said first, the truth shall scare the hell out of you, then it will set you free. The French philosopher Voltaire wrote, we leave the world as foolish and wicked as we found it. If we allow our memories to wander down the corridors of time, we realize that each generation has contributed to humanity's legacy of violence. Focus on any place or any time. The primary process of change and managing conflict is violence. The Middle East, for example, one of the cradles of civilization. The Babylonians conquered all the small nations and ruled with an iron fist, followed by the Hittites, slaughtered the Babylonians, destroyed ba Babylon. The Assyrians, followed by the Persians, the Persians uh, were conquered by the Macedonians. Then came the Romans. Islamic armies fought with the Crusaders down to our very present day. And we don't have to uh, talk about that. We see it every day in the newspaper. In Europe, well, the English fought the French. The French fought the Germans. The Germans fought the Italians and the Austrians. The Spanish fought the English. The English fought the Irish. Uh, it goes on and on. They fought the First World War, the war to end all wars. It wasn't the end. There was a Second World War. In my own country, America, we fought a war to gain independence. And once we had independence, then we turned around and systematically slaughtered the indigenous peoples. We try to forget that. We fought a civil war, the first of the modern wars. And in a very short hour, thousands, tens of thousands of men died. It's as if suddenly all of us were dead in just a matter of a minute. That was the first war in which uh, the systematic destruction of a people's economy became a tactic of war. Asia hasn't done much better in Africa. Africa rebel soldiers are cutting off the hands and arms of children and women. Uh, now in India, and we wonder what Grandpa Gandhi would say, 
uh, Hindus and Muslims are still butchering each other, men, woman, and child. Now when we consider violence, all the human emotions, except perhaps compassion, can be turned to fuel violence. And one of the most unsettling insights into violence is that it's not our base aggressive instincts that create the most violence, but our unselfish devotions, our unselfish devotions to a nation, patriotism, unselfish devotion to a race, unselfish devotion to a political ideology or religious belief. Now, this litany of horrors surrounds me in a cloud of despair. And I find myself recalling Shakespeare's thoughts as expressed by that violent murderer, Macbeth. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterday lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle, life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and fruts his hour upon the stage and is heard no more. A tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Nothingness and despair. Despair and nothingness. Now for me, nothingness and despair are not abstract concepts. I brooded upon the horrors which I just recited. And I recall years ago waking up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat with a visceral realization that there is nothing necessary about humanity. Just as the dinosaurs went extinct, humanity can fade into nothingness. In the vastness of this mysterious universe, which as best we can calculate has been expanding outward for 14 billion light years, we are indeed small candles. Nothingness and despair, despair and thus nothingness. But wait, not all has been said. Human existence is a paradox. The great philosophers of despair and nothingness, the likes of Kierkegaard, Dostoevsky, Camus, and Tillich, to name just a few, tell us that truly Authentic human existence begins with the feeling of being lost, with the anxiety of despair, the dread of nothingness. Now, Dr. Gandhi can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the great champions of nonviolence, like your grandfather, courageously and honestly confront hum humanity's violence. The philosophy of nonviolence is not a simplistic, naive, shallow response to the human predicament. It's a mature philosophy that sees deeply in the human condition and out of the darkness of despair creates a light of hope. Now, I don't think we can contemplate the choice Dr. Gandhi gave us tonight in the general and the abstract. If we do, the logic dictates that the human species must either choose between nonviolence or pass into extinction. Now, in the ab abstract, I'm afraid we're left with a very pessimistic vision. For I don't uh, think the human race will ever become totally nonviolent. My life and your life, however, is not an abstraction. Each life is specific, 
concrete and unique in each of our lives, each day of our lives, the determinism of abstract logic gives way to the freedom and responsibility of an individual human life. In each of us, human nature is as evil or as good as it can be in that particular place and in that particular time. In my life and your life, infinite mystery becomes finite existence. The formlessness takes conscious form, and we, we are responsible. Dr. Gandhi's examples of nonviolence reminds us that wherever and whenever people choose nonviolence, they create hope out of despair, existence out of nothingness. Life is indeed a paradox, a paradox of good and evil, of determinism and freedom, of fate and responsibility. But as long as we keep the paradox alive, we have reason to be optimistic. And I think that is the message Dr. Gandhi gives us tonight. Thank you. When I was um, thinking about nonviolence in, in preparation for doing this brief commentary and also listening to the inspiring words of Dr. Gandhi, I found myself thinking a lot about the sources of violence because I think there's a kind of simplistic nonviolence and a more rich and complex and humane nonviolence. Perhaps the simplistic form is, is simply to say, well, don't be violent, you know, stop those impulses or rechannel those impulses. And I think a lot of us, while we, you know, recognize the need for that theoretically, in practice find it very hard to do that, to, you know, to master the, the pain and the fear and the anger and the frustration and the resentments that rise. Um, in us as individuals and also in us as societies and as nations. So I think perhaps the, you know, the, one of the rich underlying questions is, you know, what really are the roots of violence? And, and Dr. Gandhi clearly touched on that when he, he talked about fear and he talked about greed. Um, the, the last commentator also talked about paradoxically the role of unselfish devotion sometimes in instigating violence in the name of God and in the name of country. But at least for myself, I, I have the feeling that a lot of the violence that rises up in me and in those around me has to do with pain. That somehow if you probe not very far beneath the surface, you discover that somebody before they cause pain to another person is in pain themselves. And they're almost reaching out to, to express, literally to press outward that pain upon those around them. And, and clearly sometimes the pain has to do with fear. Sometimes it has to do with, with greed that can't be alloyed. Um, a lot of times it has to do with some kind of historical experience of suffering. And I think about that when I look, for example, at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and you just see the, the, the decades and, the, and even the centuries and even the millennia of suffering that uh, gets fed into that violent situation and expressed in, in bombings and, and vendettas and, you know, on and on. And I remember somebody asking uh, Rabbi Shachter Shalomi, um, a very wonderful uh, Jewish rabbi who started the Jewish Reconstruction, Reconstructionist movement, what are we to do about that conflict? How can we ever diffuse the rage between the Israelis and the Palestinians? 
And he said, the first thing they have to do is to sit down and really listen to one another and listen to each other's stories of pain. You know, the Israelis have to hear the suffering that the Palestinian people have experienced and the Palestinian people have to really listen to the tremendous suffering of the Israelis and, and the suffering in, in Jewish history and the Holocaust and anti-Semitism and freedom beyond that. And before there can be any reconciliation of the violence, first the two parties have to cry and they have to cry together because of course this history of pain and suffering has the potential to unite them. The stories are very similar. And that potential for unity is broken when we, when we point a finger at the other and say, I am in tremendous pain, but you're the one who caused the pain. And though abstractly I know that you're in pain, your pain doesn't matter, or your pain is, is justly reaped by the cruelty of your actions, or your pain is insignificant compared to mine. I don't want to hear your pain. All I know is my pain. And, and Rabbi Schachter said, no, we really have to listen to each other's pain, and we have to, we have to cry <laughs> on one another's shoulders. Somehow we have to address the pain itself at the primary level. And then the violence can begin to dissolve. It's not necessarily that we shut it off or that we violently repress it, but it begins to dissolve as the pain is expressed in a more natural and, and, and healing way of, of grieving. And I just feel that there's so much pain circulating around the world, you know, the, the pain of, of the Arabs, the pain of the Americans since September 11th, the pain of, of the Pakistanis, the Indians, Israelis, the Palestinians, we can go on and on. And, and just our individual pain that we express in our own lives. And, and somehow I feel like we need to pause and, and, and honor that pain, uh, listen to that pain, cry through that pain, and, and be with that pain if we're ever to dissipate the violence. It's indeed a matter of great honor, privilege to be speaking to this panel, with this panel on a topic of such utmost importance. I grew up in India and I was not quite 14 on 30th of January 1948 when early morning on the radio we heard that Mahatma Gandhi has been killed. And I remember in a very private space in a very private moment. Somehow, I don't know why, but I cried a lot. Why did they have to kill Gandhi? Over the years, I have seen lots of violence, lots of it. I've traveled through the countryside of India from north to south, from east to west, in between, everywhere. I've seen hamlets of landless laborers, workers, untouchables burned to ashes, people burned to ashes. I've seen people mutilated. I've seen women being killed, burned to, to die by their husbands. I've seen quite a bit. I've known quite a bit. I've traveled, including your grandfather's birthplace, poor Bandar. Kashmir, Kanyakumari, Assam. And as a sociologist, of course, it has been a matter of great concern for many years. At Simon Fraser University, I even taught a course called Violence and War. A little bit by a small example from our own community of people from India who live here in Vancouver. <coughs> 
once in a while people call me up in distress for help, for support. <clears throat> a woman calls me up, Hari Bhai, Brother Hari, please help me, what do I do? <clears throat> I said, what happened? The man is drunk and he's about to beat me up. And I've been calling with that fam by that family before and similar situations before. I said, well, shall I call the police? I said, shall I come? I said, come if you can. But then within five, 10 minutes, she calls me up and tells me the story what happened. The man was drinking, children were hungry, it was something like 11 o'clock at night. Food was getting cold. There was a desperation of the, in the man's life for unemployment. He finished a bottle of whiskey. And then he said, where's the other bottle? Bring me some more. She said, no, it's about time. You sit down and eat. Children are nervous. Food is getting cold. I got to go to work tomorrow. He said, no. Get me the bottle. I said, no, no, I'm not going to give you the second bottle. You're already too drunk now. So he gave her all kinds of filthy names, tried to get up and walk to the kitchen to get to the other bottle. So the woman walked faster than him. She grabbed the bottle, opened it, emptied the entire content in the sink before the man could get there. Wisely, I suppose. Correctly, I suppose. The man saw the alcohol going down the drain. And he just got furious. He grabbed the bottle from her hand, grabbed her neck and said, how dare you? And I won't repeat the words he used to, to, to address his wife. And he grabbed the bottle like this and is about to hit her head with that bottle. The consequences could be very predictable. She could die, she could have brain damage, she could have a big gashing wound. She tells me later on, Hari Bhai, I looked at him, I just gave him a big slap on his face. Just a huge slap. So angry was I that, that here are my children crying, he's about to kill me. I just gave him a slap on the face. And the man couldn't bear it. He just collapsed and rolled down. And she called the police, and then she called me. This is what exactly happened the second time she called me. This woman was violent. She hit him. She damaged him. She hurt him. But there is violence as against the violence. I think Dr. Gandhi very correctly pointed out. I respect him for it that there is a certain element of desperation in what is going on in the Palestine. There is a certain element of desperation also in this great deal of part of the world where we come from, in the whole world, which may or may not be very much behind what happened in 9-11. You said all of that, and I appreciate that. Let me point out this, that there are violence cannot simply be lumped into one simple category. We are born being dishonest if we do that. The violence which takes place between two powerful rivals, pirates, gangsters, who are claiming to uh, take away the territory of the other gangster. The Second World War, the First World War, what was these wars all about? Powerful countries fighting with each other, powerful countries fighting with each other in order to conquer or, or to carve out colonies in Asia, Latin America, and Africa. That was the old war was all about. Germany didn't have a colony, Italy didn't have a colony, and uh, uh, Japan didn't have a colony. These are the three countries that became the Axis. They are the ones who, who started the war. They wanted colonies. Italy began the war, Second World War, let's talk about it, in 1936, when it attacked Ethiopia. So there's one war where the powerfuls of the world, gangsters of the world, or gangsters in your own neighborhood, in your own town, 
fight out to stake the claim on the territories so that they can continue or, or increase their boot, increase their loot. That's one war, one form of violence. The second form of violence is the violence which those who have the power, who have the privilege, and it has been legitimized for over centuries, and they want to maintain that power and privilege and will do anything to suppress anybody who challenges that power and privilege. That's the second, they will, they will, they will commit genocide, they will send tanks, like the Chinese government did in, in Peking, like the government of India has done in many places, like in Washington, uh, in, in America, uh, uh, it happened at Kent State, four young men were killed because these young men had the, dare, had the power to dare challenge American policy in Vietnam, like men beat up their wives every day because the woman tried to stand up and say, no, I'm an equal, that I have an equal human right equal dignity, equal right to dignity. So that's the violence of those who are in power, who have had that power for centuries, and who feel threatened that their power is going to be taken away from them, and they will inflict violence on those who challenge them. And this is the whole history our friend mentioned. All the wars in Europe, all the crusades, etc. If the wars, war in Vietnam, what was it? Why did America have to go and inflict all that misery on the poor people, little people of Vietnam? Because Vietnam had challenged. That's exactly what is happening in Palestine, etc. And the third is the violence in which, the example of which was the woman who slapped her husband to save her life. To save her life. To save her future and her, the future of her children. They're reconciled now. The man called the next day from the lockup, the police lockup. He was doubly beaten up by those, some other people in the police lockup on Main Street. So, uh, but when, when the oppressed of the world, when the oppressed anywhere rise up and claim their just shares, and they find that they cannot get that, they may start throwing stones. They may start shouting slogans. They may start leafleting. They may start making democratic claims, forming unions and associations, and they get beaten up. So that violence of the oppressed is of a third kind. I think uh, it is an honor to be listening to Dr. Uh, Arun Gandhi, uh, was privileged to be the grandson of the great Gandhi. Sometimes I wonder, sometimes I wonder what a strange paradox it is that this apostle of nonviolence of the last century had to be born in a country which is perhaps the most violent in its character, violent in its social structure violent in its class formation, violent in its gender relationship, and it's not just the Hindus and Muslims who are butchering each other, my friend. They are, but it's not. It's the Hindu nationalist political party which has emerged, which is commit committing genocide, which is, committing, which is imposing its, uh, its ideological vision of the future of India. It is going against all minorities, not just the Muslims, the Christians are also being slaughtered. Anybody who, even Hindus, who don't accept that agenda, they are being slaughtered, they are being killed. If I'm in India tomorrow, I probably will have a very hard time saving my life from these goons. Many of my friends are facing the same situation. I want to draw the attention, if Mr. Chair will allow me. I had requested, I called Dr. Gandhi's office all over, try to locate him, try to persuade him if he could stay for two more days in Vancouver. On the 20th, a day after tomorrow, at, two at one o'clock, the organization I represent, South Asian Network 
for Secularism and Democracy is organizing a, a, a public forum on the genocide which took place in Gujarat. It is not Hindus and Muslims who are slaughtering. It was a genocide, an ethnic cleansing in a matter of 72 hours, matter of 72 hours, uh, uh, thousands of organized, armed, abated, state-supported, in fact, state-sponsored people marched into the neighborhoods where Muslims lived, dragged the people out, cut them into pieces, burned them, raped women, pulled out the fetus from a pregnant woman, chopped it up, put it in the fire, and on and on. There's a horrible stories. Almost 2,000 people killed in a matter of 72 hours. Thousands and thousands of properties were looted and burned. 100,000 were turned overnight refugees. I invite you, please, if you have time and inclination, to know about this gory violence going on right now in a part of the world which is supposed to be the land of Mr. Gandhi, land of the apostle of nonviolence. I invite you, please come. Uh, I have a few of these, one o'clock to five o'clock at the Institute uh, of Justice in New Westminster on the corner of McBride and 8th Avenue. The forum is co-sponsored by the UBC Center for Women and Gender Relations, as well as my former Department of Sociology and Anthropology, and by at least a dozen organizations within the South Asian diaspora community here in Vancouver. So that's all I have to say, and sorry for making me this pitch, but it's important. We wanted Mr. Gandhi to stay. We wanted Dr. Gandhi to stay and, and be with us that day, but regretfully he cannot. I don't know whose glass it is, but I'm going to drink it. Thank you. Thank you very much to these uh, three respondents. Uh, we've been engaging in uh, a couple of hours of uh, reflection, or almost that, and uh, certainly these, uh, these comments uh, help us continue to think about the, 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 the very serious issue that we've been dealing with. Uh, I was just thinking as I was coming this evening to a, uh, on the news, the number of references to violences in our world on the news. Uh, the, the, the 20th um, hijacker uh, uh, was confessed today. Uh, bring the, the judge to to uh, wonder whether this man had, was full of his, uh, had his senses because he confessed and wanted the trial over, pleaded guilty. We have this uh, young man who, this heinous crime of, uh, of killing a, a 10-year-old girl who confessed today to this violence. So the issue of violence is something that, that, uh, that we really, we have so many references to and the issue that Dr. Gandhi has uh, addressed this evening is, is what do we do about it? There's, there's so many instances of this, and even our last speaker made a reference to the terrifying violence that continues. So the world uh, since uh, Mahatma Gandhi is not getting better, is it? And so uh, we've all... Uh, you, uh, I would ask you to, uh, to stand up, uh, perhaps state your name, and also, would you be very clear in your questions so that Dr. Gandhi can hear them, but also uh, I'm a little hard of hearing and I would like to hear them too. So, yes, first please. that question yes <clears throat> uh, that's a good question <clears throat> I, I hope all of you have heard it she wanted to know what gives me hope to continue this work in spite of all the violence that we see around uh, in the world today and I think what really gives me hope is what uh, I learned from grandfather and he said that uh, you must remember that you cannot change the whole world, 
but that wherever you go, you must be a farmer who goes out and plants seeds and uh, waits for a good crop to emerge. So in the same sense, you go out and plant the seeds in the minds of people and just hope and pray that those seeds will germinate. So I go everywhere and I plant seeds and I hope that some of the seeds that I planted here tonight will germinate. She works in a political situation uh, and she faces a lot of passive regression uh, in her work there and she wants to know how to use nonviolence to set things right. Is that correct? Okay. Okay, uh, I think it somewhat relates to what John said about, um, you know, we, we've been faced with so much violence from prehistoric times, and, and so uh, our tendency has become to uh, accept it, that it's there, we can't change it, so let's become part of it and use it, and so it gets perpetuated uh, generation after generation. But it's not something that has to live with us, because as civilized human beings, we have progressed in many fields, um, and made some startling progress in science and, and other fields there. But in one field, we have refused to make any progress at all, and that is our personal uh, relationships and, and our uh, use of violence there. And that is how we have perpetuated violence from generation to generation and we continue to perpetuate it all the time because we have accepted that as the only way we can deal with with crisis or conflict. So even in a, in a work situation, if we become a part of the system, because the system exists there, then a change will never occur. But if we wake up and we feel that uh, you know something has to be done and we need to change the system and we begin to make that change, eventually the system will change and, and others will follow and become part of that new system. That's a good question. <clears throat> I don't know how I would have reacted. Um, I would perhaps, first of all, being that age, you know, I was a 16 and I don't think a very bright 16 year old. Um, if he suddenly just said, I'm forgiving you, I would first of all wonder what is he forgiving me for? 
And so if I said, if, you know, if he's going to take it so easy for giving me for everything I've done, then I'll go on doing it because he's going to forgive me for it. So, I mean, that's my gut reaction at the moment there. But forgiveness is a very important aspect of the philosophy of nonviolence. But forgiveness has always got to be unconditional. Just as love is unconditional, forgiveness has to be <laughs> unconditional. We can't say that I'll forgive you if you do this or do that and behave this way or behave that way. That is not forgiveness. Forgiveness has to be unconditional. And also forgiveness is not forgetting. You know, that what people say that forgive and forget, that's very wrong. You never forget. It's part of you and it, you're going to live with it. But when you forgive, what you're doing is you're releasing yourself from that anger that is consuming you and using your energy of that anger in positive action to see that this kind of thing doesn't happen again. Well, it will certainly not happen automatically. It will have to be the people's movement. People will have to wake up and say, this is wrong and we are not going to be a party to this kind of thing. Only then a change will take place. But there are some factors that we have to remember. That while there is a lot of violence, there's no denying it uh, in Gujarat and all over India, there is uh, a lot of violence taking place there. But we, st we tend to focus on that violence and we forget that there are lots of people at the grassroots level who are doing wonderful work to transform society, but that never gets publicized and people don't know much about it and so we just have that one tunnel vision of violence. So I'm not trying to downplay the violence that is taking place there. It's awful, it's tremendous and shameful. In fact, I wrote an article after the, um, the Gujarat riots in which I said I'm ashamed to call myself a Gujarati, an Indian, uh, and um, I, I just can't believe that my people would do such things. That article has been posted on my um, website <clears throat> and so I, I do feel the agony of it. But we can only change that if, when we, the intellectuals, and especially people living abroad uh, who have witnessed and, and been uh, part, part of a very broad-based society, if we stand up and say we are not going to accept this, Unfortunately, what is happening today is that these fundamentalist Hindus are being supported by money from here, from the Western countries. They're so rich with money from, uh, from all over the Western countries that they can do whatever they like there in India with that money. Buy people and, and do all kinds of uh, horrible things there. So we have to uh, stop and think about what are we doing to our country. And it's that greed and selfishness and self-centeredness that is consuming all of us.
Mm-hmm. Yes, that was another way of forgiving, that he, through his own self-suffering, uh, he was showing me why I had done wrong and, and you know, Oh, sorry. <coughs> Well, that's a good question. It came, comes up very often, uh, and um, <clears throat> yeah, we have to remember a few things there. First of all, um, there need not have been a Hitler at all. Um, actually, World War Two was just an extension of World War One. World War One didn't end at all. We just allowed it to go on. And Hitler emerged because of our greed, because of the Allied forces when they won World War I and we imposed such tremendous uh, war reparations on Germany uh, to, to get back uh, economically what we had lost in World War, that we caused a, a mind-boggling inflation in Germany. I mean, let me give you an example. In 1914, before World War I, a dollar was worth four marks. By 1918, a dollar was worth eight marks. And by 1921, a dollar was worth three trillion marks. So a German housewife had to go to a store to buy a loaf of bread with suitcases full of money. And they didn't even have paper to print money, so they were pin printing them on bed sheets and pillowcases and using that as currency. So it was that kind of inflation that really tormented the German people. And when Hitler emerged to give the German people some hope and, and credence there, they grasped that hope. And then Hitler did what he had to do because he was consumed by hate and, and prejudice there. But, you know, somebody asked grandfather this question also in 1945, and his answer to that was that, uh, you know, nobody, this is a hypothetical question, so he said, I'll give you a hypothetical answer. Then nobody has used nonviolence on this scale, so I can't tell you exactly what will happen. But he said that we fought a war, and in the war we killed 60 million people to get rid of Hit Hitler and his philosophy of uh, Nazism, hate and prejudice. What we succeeded in doing was to kill Hitler and kill the Nazi army but the philosophy of hate and prejudice still continues to thrive and threaten. So we were not able to get the root of the problem out. We just finished off the person there. But he said, let us assume that all the people living in the nation surrounding Germany, if they, the men, women, and children came out and surrounded the border of Germany and squatted there and refused to move from there and refused to let the German army come out of its border, could the German army kill 60 million innocent men, women, and children and live with their conscience? He said there's reason to believe that even they had a conscience 
They may have killed a few million, but at that point they would have said, this is madness, we cannot go on with this, and the war would have stopped there. There is reason, there, there are some examples, uh, and they are listed in uh, Gene Sharp's book, uh, The Politics of Nonviolent Action, um, <clears throat> where people successfully used nonviolence against Hitler in small contexts. One of them was in uh, Norway when uh, fascist forces overtook Norway and Quisling was installed as the prime minister there. He was ordered to introduce fascist education and make it compulsory for the teachers of Norway to become members of a fascist union so that they could be controlled. And when these orders were passed, all the teachers unanimously decided that this was an injustice and they were not going to be a party to this. So they all wrote a letter to the prime minister and said, we are willing to suffer the consequences, but we are not going to be a party to this injustice. And the prime minister arrested several of them, sent them to concentration camps, killed them, did everything they could to break the resolve of the teachers, but they remained steadfast. They refused to budge. And eventually, Hitler had to tell Quisling to back off and let normal education continue in, um, in Norway. So there are examples of this kind of thing having worked there. Who knows what could have happened? Yes, I think um, I do want to start drawing this to a conclusion quite, quite soon. Uh, Mr. Kuhn, please. So very quickly, Mr. Gandhi, you have mentioned that the channel energy by talking about warning and the responsible power. Uh, I have visited uh, Palestine, and you know, I have talked to many people there, with Israel as well. Uh, there is a fence called Shouting Fence, which divides Egypt and Gaza. There are two fences, 75 feet apart. And the only way people can communicate with each other is by shouting. That's why they call it shouting fence. There are many examples which are probably the root cause of the violence in that area. I just mentioned one. The refugee homes, they are built with concrete roof ceilings. Uh, many of the refugees have been living in those refugee homes for over 50 years mm -hmm. of their life, many generations in fact. So I want to ask you a question by way of an analogy. In Kitten, we have domestic pressure cooker, where the heat is produced and steam is you know, generated. Steam is energy, which can be channelized in various ways. You gave an example of electricity, but I use steam here. If by any chance, you cannot channelize the steam into positive direction, and you don't want steam at all. So one way to get rid of steam is removing heat under the pressure cooker, rather than putting the pressure on the pressure cooker to contain that steam. There's always an escape wall that will burst out and steam will come out from the escape wall and it cannot make the weight. Mm -hmm. That's military, I mean, the military weight. So would you see that uh, channelizing the energy into positive direction or positive means, you know, going to the root cause of one thing, why the international community is ignoring the root cause of the problem? Well, that's wonderful, yeah, and that's what I wonder also all the time because, you know, we've been sitting back and watching all these uh, places going down the drain and not doing anything about it because we have become so self-contained and selfish. And we seem to think that as long as we live secure in our own countries that, uh, you know, the rest of the world can go to a pot and, and we don't care about it. We don't accept the fact that what is going going on there in that part of the world is eventually going to affect us, and we have to get up and, and take notice of that. It's only when the whole world gets up and starts acting and stops being so self-centered that we'll be able to find a solution to all these problems there. But as long as we remain 
self-contained and, and selfish and you say, well, I have secured my home. I have the best security available there and nobody can harm anything. So whatever happens on the streets, I'm not concerned about that. Then eventually that violence is going to consume you. Even the best of security is not going to help us uh, contain it. So, you know, I, and that's what I said, the Palestinian young people uh, who are making these sacrifices are doing it because of the pressure cooker you're talking about. They've reached a point when they don't know what else to do, and they, they do the, these kinds of things. So it, it's, a, it's an example of the desperation of people. And if the rest of the world doesn't wake up and, and do this, that violence is going to be directed against us. I think uh, I'm going to assume the prerogative of the chair and I bring this to a conclusion. I think you've all uh, shown a great uh, concentration on these uh, thoughts that have been presented. And uh, I do apologize. There were a couple of other people that, that did want to, uh, to uh, ask questions, but we have uh, spent uh, a lot of time thinking about this important issue. I think that it might be appropriate to uh, bring this to a conclusion. Um, Dr. Paul Wong is going to make a, a brief announcement, uh, but let's, before we do that, uh, thank uh, both Dr. Gandhi and also the three respondents for their contribution this evening. Thank you for the applause. <laughs> I shall make one brief announcement, okay? Dr. Gandhi will be available to do some book signing, and he will not charge $5 with autograph.